Welcome to Newsday on the BBC. I'm Sharon Jeet Lail in Singapore. The headlines. I'm Babita Sharma in London, also in the programme. Well, good morning. It's 8 a.m. here in Singapore, midnight in London, and 8 in the morning as well in Manila, where President Trump is in the Philippines to attend the ASEAN summit that's due to get underway shortly. He's set to meet the controversial leader, Rodrigo Duterte, whose drug war has claimed thousands of lives. Well, joining us from uh, Manila now is the BBC's uh, Howard Johnson, who's been watching uh, proceedings there. Howard, uh, of course, we know it's uh, uh, one of the, the last days of uh, President Trump's visit to Asia. Uh, what are we expecting today? We, uh, of course, watching uh, that story very closely. Thank you. Well, President Trump as well has resumed his war of words with North Korea over their nuclear weapons program. Pyongyang insulted Mr. Trump and insisted it would stop its nuclear buildup. The president responded with an insulting tweet of his own. Let's take a look at our other top stories this hour. And Spain's prime minister says regional elections next month will help end what he called the separatist havoc in Catalonia. Mariano Rajoy was addressing a campaign event during his first visit since imposing direct rule from Madrid a fortnight ago. He urged those opposed to Catalan independence to make sure they vote. Here's the BBC's James Reynolds reporting from Barcelona. Some sports news for you now. Ferrari Sebastian Vettel took his first victory since July at the Brazilian Grand Prix, where Lewis Hamilton battled from the back to finish fourth. Vettel controlled the race after taking the lead. Hamilton, though, he did provide a lot of excitement, carving through the field in the early laps as he attempted to make up for the crash in qualifying that let him at the back of the track the last time. But more on that story coming up for you later in Sport Today. Welcome back. You're watching Newsday on the BBC. I'm Sharon Duke Lale in Singapore. Thank you for joining us. I'm Babita Sharma here in London. The headlines this hour. Let's take a look now at some of the front pages from around the world. We can start with the South China Morning Post, which uh, reports that ASEAN uh, members have declined President Donald Trump's offer to mediate between claimants to the South China Sea. Mr. Trump made the offer during his visit to Vietnam. And the Philippine Star also covers the American president's tour of Asia and claims Mr. Trump will seek to strengthen ties between his country and the Philippines when he meets his counterpart, Rodrigo Duterte on the sidelines of the ASEAN summit in Manila. And finally, the front page of the Gulf News. It says the Arab League will hold a meeting in a week, and this is at the request of Saudi Arabia to discuss what it calls violations committed by Iran in the region. So that brings you up to date with some of the papers. Uh, Babita, what are stories that are sparking discussions online? Well, Sharon, this footage has been doing the rounds. Just have a now, Indonesian security forces in the eastern province of Papua are preparing to storm five villages that they say are being held by an armed rebel group. Well, uh, let's go live now to the BBC's Rebecca Henschke, who's in the Indonesian capital, uh, Jakarta, for us. Now, Rebecca, can you give us a bit of a clearer picture of what actually is happening there and, and the context of this standoff? Yes, we're getting very conflicting information about what's happening with these five villages, as you say, just around the base of this huge gold and copper mine owned by uh, Freeport. The Indonesian government, the authorities say that uh, a splinter group of OPM, the Free Papuan Movement, has occupied the villages and they are responsible for a spate of shootings that takes in place around the mine that killed a, a police officer uh, back in August and injured a number of other people. But villagers we have spoken to s insist that they are not being held hostage and that it's in fact the authorities who are preventing villagers from coming and going so that they can raid these villages and arrest people they say are responsible for these shootings. And that's right, Rebecca, very different accounts of what's actually uh, going on there. Uh, what, what more do we know about Freeport, this very large and, and controversial mine? Well, the OPM, the, the Free Papuan Movement, has openly declared war on this mine and the police officers that are paid to protect it. Freeport pays millions of dollars every year for security for this mine. Most of that goes to the Indonesian military and the police who have been accused of rights abuses in this province that has had a, a low-level separatist conflict for decades. Uh, the local people, and particularly the separatist rebels, see the mine as a symbol of the fact that their natural resources of great wealth is being taken away from them 
for the benefit of the Jakarta elite and, and a U.S. company when they themselves are staying very poor. And our President Joko Widodo is trying to change this economic imbalance, but this conflict and this standoff once again shows how tense the situation is there. Tense indeed, uh, Rebecca. As you say, it's also a very confusing situation with so many different accounts. So are there any plans to send in international observers or international press to sort of corroborate what, what actually is going on? Well, that's a call that's coming very strongly from human rights groups here asking for journalists to be allowed in. That's not the case at the moment. This area is uh, restricted. It's around the Freeport mine. It means that even local journalists can't really operate freely inside the villages to find out what's going on. Intense security there at the moment uh, with military posts and police stopping people from entering. Foreign journalists like myself who have the rights to work in Indonesia up until recently have still had to apply for special permits to report in Papua. Now, President Joko Widodo promised that that would no longer be the case when he was elected into office. But journalists who have gone say they are still being followed by intelligence agents and they're not allowed to report freely in this province. All right, Rebecca Henschke in Jakarta watching that story very closely for us. Thank you. Fears are mounting on Manus Island for asylum seekers and refugees who will soon be forced to leave the detention camp. A court in Papua New Guinea has ruled against restoring basic services to refugees staying on the centre of the site that was once run by Australia. At least 400 people are still at the camp, which has had its electricity, running water and food cut off. Earlier, I asked the BBC's Hal Griffith when the refugees might be forcibly removed from the site. Oh, well, Griffith there. Now, Mumbai's Royal Opera House is having a renaissance of sorts. After being shut for decades for renovation work, it's now reopened and it's staging a variety of performances. It's an important moment for Indian opera, but equally significant for the show's conductor, Maria Badstu. Our Mumbai team caught up with her to find out why. Good morning. It's uh, 9 a.m. here in Singapore, 1 a.m. in London and 9 in the morning in Manila, where President Trump is in the Philippines to attend the ASEAN summit that's getting underway. He's actually in Manila. He's uh, at the uh, U.S. Embassy at the moment where we can see some protests going on behind you, Howard. Can you tell us uh, about those protests? Because, of course, we know this is President Trump's uh, last day in Asia. He's winding up his tour. as the ASEAN summit kicks off. Howard Johnson there, thank you so much. Now, President Trump has resumed his uh, war of words with North Korea over their nuclear weapons program. Pyongyang insulted Mr. Trump and he insisted it wouldn't stop its uh, nuclear buildup. The president responded with an insulting tweet of his own. This uh, news back comes as the US Navy sailed a powerful carrier air group into the Sea of Japan off the Korean Peninsula. And Rupert River Hayes reports from the USS Ronald Reagan. Let's just bring you up to date with our developing story this hour. A strong earthquake measuring 7.3 has hit the border area in northern Iraq and Iran, killing dozens of people. The epicenter was close to the Iraqi Kurdish city of Halabja. Across the border in Iran, State TV says 61 people are confirmed to have lost their lives in the west of the country. Andrew Plant has more. Yeah, we're keeping a close eye on that story for you and any more bring that to you here on BBC World News. Now, in other news, Chinese state media say the Chinese and Vietnamese leaders have reached a consensus on managing issues in the South China Sea. Some sports news for you now. In Ferrari, Sebastian Vettel took his first victory since July at the Brazilian Grand Prix, where Lewis Hamilton battled from the back to finish fourth. Vettel controlled the race after taking the lead. Hamilton did, though, provide a lot of excitement, carving through the field in the early laps as he attempted to make up for the crash in qualifying that left him at the back of the grid. We've got more on that story for you later this hour in Sport Today. Welcome back. You're watching News Day on the BBC. I'm Sharon Jit Lail in Singapore. I'm Babita Sharma here in London. Let's bring you up to date with a headline. And let's take a look at uh, some of the papers uh, right now. We can start with the uh, South China Morning Post, which uh, reports that uh, ASEAN members have uh, declined President Donald Trump's offer to mediate between claimants to the South China Sea. Mr. Trump made that offer, of course, during his visit to Vietnam. Now, the Philippine Star also covers the American president's tour of Asia and claims Mr. Trump will seek to strengthen ties uh, between his country and the Philippines when he meets his uh, counterpart, 
Rodrigo Duterte on the sidelines of the ASEAN summit in Manila. And finally, we've got the front page of the, uh, the Gulf News as well. And it says the Arab League will hold a meeting in a week at the request of Saudi Arabia to discuss what it calls violations committed by Iran in the region. And that brings you up to date with some of the papers. Well, Sharon, let me just tell you what's trending this hour. It's interesting that we're talking about the ASEAN summit uh, that's just uh, getting underway with lots of leaders coming to meet Duterte. Well, it's footage of him that's doing the rounds. Have a look at this. It's a mounting on Manus Island for asylum seekers and refugees who will soon be forced to leave the detention camp. A court in Papua New Guinea has ruled against restoring basic services to refugees, staying on the site of the centre that was once run by Australia, but it's now closed. At least 400 people are still at the camp, which has had its electricity, running water and food cut off. Let's cross live to camp. Uh, Mumbai's Royal Opera House is having a renaissance of sorts. After being shut for decades for renovation work, it's now reopened and it's staging performances of all types, including the Italian opera Il Matrimonio Segreto. It's an important moment for Indian opera, but equally significant for the show's conductor, Maria Batstu. Our Mumbai team caught up with her to find out why. Welcome to Newsday. I'm Babita Sharma in London. The headlines. And I'm Sharon Jutlail in Singapore, also on the... Welcome and thanks for joining us. It's midnight here in London, 8 a.m. in Singapore and 2 a.m. in Raqqa, Syria, where the BBC has uncovered details of a secret deal that followed the defeat of Islamic State in the city. The agreement allowed hundreds of Islamic State fighters and their families to escape, including notorious criminals. The big question now is, where are they and what sort of threat do they pose? Well, our other top story today, it's uh, day two of the ASEAN summit in Manila and leaders of Southeast Asian nations have agreed with China. Now for Manila is the BBC's uh, Howard Johnson with all the latest from that summit. Now, uh, how what's crucial is, of course, we know it is Donald Trump's last day in Asia uh, as he wraps up uh, essentially the longest trip by a US president now for decades. So what's uh, expected on the agenda today? Well, also this hour, a vast relief effort is continuing after a powerful earthquake struck. Now, in just the past hour, we've got world number one in tennis, Sir Rafael Nadal, who you see on the screen there. He's announced that he's pulling out of the ATP Tour finals because of a knee injury. Uh, he's been struggling with injury in his defeat uh, at the hands of David Goffin. The Spaniard pulled out of the Paris Masters earlier this month and he appeared to be in pain towards the end of his opening match at the uh, match at the O2 Arena in London. And continuing with sport, a real shocker here if you're an Italian or a football fan of any kind. Italy, who was shown here, you can see them training, uh, they failed to qualify for the World Cup. And that's the first time that's happened since 1958. They could only really manage a draw against uh, Sweden, who will make the tournament in Russia instead. Global carbon dioxide emissions are projected to rise for the first time in four years. Scientists at a United Nations climate conference in Germany say the main cause of the growth is the greater use of coal in China as its economy grows. Researchers say cuts in emissions are needed to avoid dangerous global warming later this century, as our science editor, David Shookman, explains. Well, you're watching Newsday on the BBC, still to come on the programme. The... Welcome back. You're watching Newsday on the BBC. I'm Sharon Jeet Lael in Singapore. Thanks for joining us. I'm Babita Sharma here in London. Our headlines for you this hour. Well, let's take a look now at some of the front pages from around the world. We can start with the Japan Times, which, of course, is leading on the ASEAN summit. Uh, and it's making the point that Donald Trump uh, prioritised uh, trade over human rights after he declined to comment on the Philippine drug war, which, uh, of course, killed thousands of people. And the uh, main photo shows, of course, the US president uh, linking arms with Rodrigo Duterte during the opening ceremony. Meanwhile, the uh, state-run newspaper, the China Daily, has more on Beijing beginning talks with members of ASEAN on a code of conduct in the South China Sea. The paper claims Beijing aims to peacefully resolve the issue. China claims uh, almost all of the South China Sea. Meanwhile, the South China Morning Post reports pro-independence groups across Hong Kong are reviving a drive to promote the city's separation from mainland China. Student leaders have vowed more activism after an earlier campaign fizzled out. And that brings you up to date with some of the papers. Uh, Babita, what are some stories sparking discussions online? 
Well, Sharon Jit, it's all about song and protest. Have a little uh, look at this. Now, let's get more on President Trump's tour across Asia, now entering its final day. It's the longest tour a U.S. president has undertaken in the region for 25 years. Shanji, you've got more on this for us. I do indeed, Babita. We've got uh, Yuvresha Taylor, who's an Asia analyst at uh, Global Risk Consultancy, Verisk Maplecroft. She joins me now. Of course, we've been talking about it. We just talked about the papers as well. It's all been focused on this trip uh, by President Trump, the longest trip, as we've all been saying, by a US president for decades now. So how would you assess it? A success, a failure? Now, it can be a cutthroat world here in TV news, but in the America of the 1970s, the competition for ratings was even more intense. A new play has opened here in London that satirizes the era. Its star, Brian Cranston, from the cult TV series Breaking Bad, has been speaking to our arts editor, Will Gompertz, about his concerns of the impact social media has on the news and the current climate in Hollywood. That's Brian Cranston there. Now, about a fifth of the world's population is without a legal identity. That's according to the United Nations. Uh, they are stateless. They're cut off from uh, accessing basic services and rights without evidence of their existence. And without that, many are left vulnerable to human trafficking, sexual slavery and child abuse. Now, one organization is seeking to change all that through the use of blockchain. That uh, this technology will allow people, refugees and immigrants in particular, uh, to always have a persistent and secure identity. Well, Humanized Internet is an organization tackling the identity crisis of stateless people through the use of this technology. Its co-founder, Monique Morrow, earlier explained to me how they will use blockchain. And that was Monique Morrow speaking to me earlier. You'll be watching Newsday. I'm Sharon Jitlail in Singapore. I'm Babita Sharma here in London. Thanks so much for joining us. Stay with us. We'll be back with the headlines next. We'll see you soon. Welcome to the programme. It's midnight here in London, 8 a.m. It's not midnight, actually. It's 1 in the morning here in London. It's 9 a.m. in Singapore and 3 a.m. in Raqqa, Syria, where the BBC has uncovered details of a secret deal that followed the defeat of Islamic State in the city. The agreement allowed hundreds of Islamic State fighters and their families to escape, including notorious criminals. The big question now is, where are they and what sort of threat do they pose? Howard Johnson there in Manila. And just to say, while Howard was talking, you saw uh, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe of Japan arriving to that summit. Now, also this hour, a vast relief effort is continuing after a powerful earthquake struck. Now, in just in the last two hours or so, world number one in tennis, Rafael Nadal, has announced that he's pulling out of the ATP Tour Finals because of a knee injury. He's been struggling with the injury in his defeat at the hands of David Goffin, and the Spaniard's been pulling out uh, as well of the Paris Masters earlier this month and appeared to be in pain towards the end of his opening match at the O2 Arena in London. And continuing with sport, a real shocker here if you're Italian or, in fact, a football fan of any kind, because Italy, as you can see, shown here training, has failed to qualify for the World Cup. And that's the first time that's happened since 1958. They could only manage a draw against Sweden, who will make the tournament instead in Russia. Asylum seekers in Papua New Guinea say officials are taking further steps to try to force more than 400 of them to leave a detention centre on Manus Island, which closed two weeks ago. The men have refused to move to other facilities, despite having their water and electricity completely cut off. They say the authorities have now started draining water tanks and dismantling fences. For the latest, Hal Griffith reports from Sydney. Welcome back. You're watching Newsday on the BBC. I'm Sharon Jitlail in Singapore. I'm Babita Sharma here in London. The headlines this hour. Let's take a look now at some of the front pages from around the world. We can start with the Japan Times, which is leading on what we've all been reporting on, the ASEAN summit, and uh, making the point, in fact, that uh, Donald Trump has prioritised trade deals over human rights after he declined to comment on the Philippine drug war, which has killed thousands of people. And you can see the main photo there. He's shown uh, linking hands with uh, uh, Rodrigo Duterte during the opening ceremony. Meanwhile, the uh, state-run uh, China Daily has more on Beijing beginning talks with members of ASEAN on a code of conduct in the South China Sea. The paper claims Beijing aims to peacefully resolve the issue. Uh, China claims almost all of the South China Sea. And the South China Morning Post reports that pro-independence groups across Hong Kong are reviving a drive to promote the city's separation from mainland China. Student leaders have vowed more activism after an earlier campaign fizzled out.
Thanks to our top story in our special report on the thousands of IS fighters and family members who are believed to have escaped Raqqa through a deal brokered by US-backed Syrian partners on the ground. Robert Ford is the former US ambassador to Syria, and he told me IS fighters heading to Europe present a real risk. And that was Robert Ford, the former US ambassador to Syria, speaking to Babita there. Now, about a fifth of the world's population is without a legal identity. That's according to the United Nations. They are stateless. They're cut off from accessing basic services and rights and without evidence of their existence. And without that, many are left vulnerable to human trafficking, sexual slavery and child abuse. Well, now one organisation is seeking to change all that through the use of blockchain technology. Now, it can be a cutthroat world here in TV news, but in the America of the 1970s, the competition for ratings was even more intense. A new play has opened up here in London that satirises the era. Its star, Brian Cranston, from the cult TV series Breaking Bad, has been speaking to our arts editor, Will Gompertz. Well, sorry to disappoint, but you're certainly not going to see any bad behaviour here on Newsday from me or Pepita. I'm Sharon Duke Leo. And I'm Pepita Sharma. Well said, Sharon Duke. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back with headlines next. Welcome to Newsday. I'm Sharon Jit Lale in Singapore. The headlines. And then also in the programme. Well, good morning. It's 8 a.m. here in Singapore, midnight in London, and 11 a.m. in Australia, where people have voted in favour of legalising same sex marriage. The results of an eight week postal vote, in which more than three quarters of eligible voters took part, were announced an hour ago. More than 61% of voters support the move. The government has promised to enact legislation enabling same-sex marriage by the end of this year. This is the moment the announcement was made. And that was David Kalish there from the Australian Bureau of Statistics actually announcing that uh, result an hour ago. Our correspondent, Hoel uh, Griffith, is in Sydney right now at Prince Albert Park, where, of course, many in the Yes camp have come uh, to celebrate uh, that moment. Uh, can you set all of this into context for us, Howell? I mean, uh, what's it like there on the ground and uh, in terms of what this means for Australia? Yeah, we'll have more coming from Australia for you and more reaction to that result later in the programme. Let's just bring you some breaking news. And in the past half an hour, soldiers are reported to have taken over the headquarters of Zimbabwe's national broadcaster, ZBC. More armoured vehicles have been seen on, seen on roads outside of the capital, Harare. Earlier, the country's ambassador in South Africa has denied suggestions of a coup. The ruling party has accused the top general of treason after he said that the military was prepared to intervene in politics. Now, you may be aware that in recent days, Mr Mugabe has sacked a number of officials who don't want his wife Grace to succeed him. We'll get more on that and what's happening in Zimbabwe for you and bring the latest to you here on BBC World News. Another look now at our other top stories this hour. The US Secretary of State Rex Tillerson will meet the head of Myanmar's military today to discuss putting an end to the violence in Rakhine State. More than 600,000 Rohingyas have now fled to Bangladesh. Our Washington correspondent Barbara Plett Usher says Mr Tillerson has called for a credible investigation into those who have committed atrocities. Also this hour, President Trump's authority to launch a nuclear attack is to be examined by Congress. It's the first time this has happened to a U.S. leader in more than 40 years. Mr. Trump has previously vowed to unleash, as he put it, fire and fury. Like Now, this is the brand new Barbie doll model, which is due to be released wearing a hijab. It's been made to honor an American fencer who became the first U.S. woman to wear the headscarf while competing at the Rio Olympics. Ibti Haj Mohammed won a bronze medal last year in Rio and says the doll is a childhood dream come true. Now, the president of France, Emmanuel Macron, has told the BBC that Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin are threatening Western values of openness and tolerance. It's uh, now six months since Mr Macron took office, promising to transform French society, the economy and even its modern sense of identity in the world. Our Paris correspondent Lucy Williamson, who travelled with the president to Abu Dhabi recently, sent this report. Welcome back. You're watching Newsday on the BBC. I'm Sharon Jit Lale in Singapore. Thanks for joining us. I'm Babita Sharma in London. The headlines are... Well, let's take a look now at some of the front pages from around the world. We can start with the uh, Philippine Star, which reports that the Association of uh, Southeast Asian Nations, or ASEAN, as well as the US uh, and the European Union, they've all agreed to uphold the freedom of navigation in the South 
China Sea. It also reports that President Duterte considered it a, a personal and official insult that uh, Canadian Prime Minister uh, Justin Trudeau uh, had uh, discussed extrajudicial killings in an informal meeting with him. Now, the state-run newspaper, the China Daily, says Beijing has assured leaders at the ASEAN summit of safe navigation in the South China Sea. Premier Li Keqiang said as the largest country in the region, in the South China Sea, and a major user of its sea lanes, he wants peace. Now, the Japan Times reports that U.S. Sir Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross has urged Japanese automakers to reduce exports. He says he wants to make it more attractive for Japanese companies to engage in production in the U.S. This, of course, is to try to cut the trade deficit. And that's it for the papers. Just want to bring you some breaking news that's coming to us, an update of what's happening in central Harare in Zimbabwe. We're getting reports on the Reuters news agency, uh, quoting a witness saying that loud explosions have been reportedly heard in the capital. Uh, we also heard a short time ago that soldiers are reported to have taken over the headquarters of Zimbabwe's national broadcaster ZPBC. And that also there are reports that armoured vehicles have been seen on roads outside of the capital. Uh, there are reports that a coup is underway. We're just waiting for verification of that. But you may well remember that earlier the country's ambassador in South Africa denied those suggestions of a coup. And the ruling party has been accused by the top general of treason after he said that the military was prepared to intervene in politics. Now, this has all come about in recent days after the leader, uh, Robert Mugabe, has sacked a number of officials who don't want his wife, Grace, to succeed him. And it does seem to be that some kind of a situation is unfolding in central Harare, according to the Reuters news agency, that loud explosions have been heard following the news a short time ago of those reports that the state broadcaster has come off air. We'll keep you updated on that as soon as we get it. Now, let's return to our other breaking story this hour. And that was a news an hour ago that the vote for same-sex marriage in Australia was favoured during a postal ballot. We can speak now to James Brecht. That's right. Once again, congratulations to the happy couple. Now, the island of Manhattan at the heart of New York City is a pretty valuable piece of land, but it seems it wasn't always that way. 300 years ago, the Dutch gave it to the British in return for a tiny spice island in what is now Indonesia. And back then, a man has on to update you on our breaking news this hour from Zimbabwe, where we're getting reports from the Reuters news agency that loud explosions have been heard in the capital, central Harare. And also a short time ago, there are reports that armoured vehicles have entered the capital city. Uh, in the past half hour as well, Zimbabwe has reported that, they, uh, that soldiers indeed in the country have taken over the state broadcaster ZBC. This is, of course, amid tensions between President Robert Mugabe and the armed forces after the general of the army, Constantino Chiwenga, warned that he was prepared to intervene after Mr Mugabe fired a number of his officials in his cabinet last week, many thinking that he's paving the way for his uh, wife, Grace, to take charge. Uh, but we'll keep you more... Uh, information on that as soon as it develops but just that uh, breaking news and that loud explosions have been reported in central harare in zimbabwe and you've been watching newsday stay with us because coming up